Nico Dekens. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's an honor for me to finally be here. I wanted to be here for years, but somehow my agenda didn't allow it. So I'm very happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, so I'll just start off with uh, a little bit telling about uh, to talk to you about who I am. Um, so I'm an ocean specialist. I was trained by the Dutch government. So I was uh, officially I was trained as an intelligence analyst for operational, tactical, and strategical analysts. And I think around let's say halfway the 90s, I discovered that, hey, the internet might stay here. So let's start exploring that. And uh, at that time, I was doing analysis on youth gangs in the Netherlands. And I was, I was like, hey, maybe those guys and girls are active on the internet. And that's those street cops know a little bit about the criminals that they're dealing with. But maybe by looking at an online footprint, we can find, let's say, a different view of what they are doing and what, how, what connects them. So that that's something that triggered me, and luckily I had a team leader that basically said, hey, Nico, here you have carte blanche, uh, here you have uh, money for a laptop, and start exploring this. There were no rules there then, so it was li literally kindergarten for me. I could do whatever I wanted to do. So uh, after that, um, I, well, after that, it's really brief. Um, after 25 years, I basically uh, said, hey, I want to do more. And the Dutch government said, well, we know you want to do more, but we can't allow you to do more. So this is where basically our, we had a divorce, a little divorce. I still uh, am in close contact with a lot of the people that I work with. Uh, but then I moved to Bellingcat. Bellingcat, an online investigative journalistic uh, collective that do, let's say, all kinds of awesome research when it comes to war crimes and all that kind of stuff. For example, the MH17 downing, they did some awesome work in there. Um, but that marriage, again, was not good enough for me because I was in the government and I was trained to have very strict operation security. And within Bellingcat, that at that moment in time, well, was different. Let's put it like that. So we were fished, my daughter was fished, and, and my parents and my grandmother, I was like, well, this is looking at what they do, trying to find Russian hackers and Russian state nationals. Well, I like to brief and I would like to continue to do that. So we had to go away. I was in contact with some other people and I became a SANS instructor. Uh, so I built courses for SANS, the SANS Institute, a United States company. And now currently I run my own little shop called Dutch Ocean Guy. And I recently moved over to Shadow Dragon, a company basically that builds some scalable tools for open source intelligence. But enough about me. At least now you know a little bit who I am. But feel free to ask me more questions. I'll be here the entire weekend. So uh, don't be afraid. I won't bite. At least I promise I won't bite. Um, a little bit about open source intelligence, and for those who have never heard about open source intelligence, open source intelligence is um, collecting and processing, but more importantly, analyzing information that is coming from open sources that addresses an intelligence requirement. So it always starts with a question that someone wants to have an answer or multiple answers to. And based upon that, you start looking on let's say the internet, but not only the internet, could also be traditional newspapers or TV or a library. And open source intelligence does not limit itself to, um, let's say the service internet, the deep web, the dark web, but also resources that uh, you may need to uh, pay a little bit of money for. So an open source for me, and we can have a large debate about it, but it will not do that now. An open source must be a source that is accessible for anyone around the world depending, of course, a little bit on their budget sometimes, but it should be a source that your neighbor should also be able to find as long as they have the proper skill set and the proper hardware and software to do that. So that inspired me, and I've been doing this for, well, almost 30 years now already. Yes, I'm that old. And you can see by this little uh, Google graph that there is a a little trend when it comes to open source intelligence. So the blue line is open source intelligence and open source intelligence has risen um, and it has to do with a lot of wars, a lot of um, other things where people started to see opportunities with exploring the internet to mostly for accountability kind of research where you want to find something, maybe a hacker group, maybe again a criminal group, maybe something related to war, and you can use those sources to tell a story in essence. So it's a used growth market. But everything starts always for me with the general open source intelligence or let's say the traditional intelligence cycle. I cannot do any research without a question. 
So without questions, I will never have answers for you. So it always starts with planning and direction. So I talk to a client, I talk to someone, and I ask them, what do you want me to find out? And on average, they will tell us, Nico, I want everything. <laughs> yeah, but what's everything? Yeah, everything you can find on the internet. Yeah, so okay, give me a couple of petabytes of data storage and I will collect everything and you can sort it out yourself. But that's not how it works. So you need to take mostly clients by the hand and deliberately ask them, hey, if there's one thing that you want to have an answer to, what, do, what would that be? Well, for example, did Nico visit Hacker Hotel in 2023? That's a question that I can work with. So with that, you basically start building your tools, you start scoping what's in limitations, what's out of the limitations, how to uh, secure my computer. So operation security is pretty important because I have something to hide for an from an adversary. And then we start collecting the data. And collecting the data means that we will look in numerous places to see pieces of the puzzle. And those pieces of the puzzle very often come in suboptimal for formatting. So we need to process and exploit the data. Then we analyze it. And most of the times we take a step back because when we analyze the information, we will see that we have gaps in our information. So we go back to the scoping and so on. It's an endless loop until we have satisfied our needs. So very brief. But mostly when I look at my research, and I really love this uh, quote by Einstein because it says, hey, if I had an, only one hour to solve a problem, I would like to use the first 55 minutes to start thinking about that problem, properly thinking about that problem, preferably with a group of people uh, that are not always necessarily open source intelligence specialists because I like to listen to different angles, different perspectives. And with that, potentially then I could solve that puzzle within the five minutes, because now we have a good attack plan. We know where to look, but more importantly, we know where not to look. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge within open source intelligence, because there are too many, ra too many rabbit holes to go into. Now, when we, when we look at the history, when we look at where, well, this was before I was born, but open source intelligence has its roots um, probably around World War II. So I did a lot of research seeing, looking at when people starting, uh, started to talk about open source intelligence, the actual word. So we noticed that mostly during World War, War, World War I, people started gathering information from newspapers, from radio, from uh, libraries, from other broadcast or singles interceptions that they could do. And that was the first start of open source intelligence. This is how it started. It was a lot of manual work, a lot of manual processing of data. And that became more and more challenging. Um, of course, the early 90s, when the internet started to begin and started to become a little bit more, let's say, mainstream, um, open source intelligence became more standard, became more adopted, but also it was still mostly done by governments within the intelligence community, not necessarily by, let's say, people like you and me that do normal day jobs and just like to spend time to puzzle, puzzle all the time, because that's what I do the entire day. So when I look at the past 25 years, we look at the 9-11 text. We, uh, we look at the uh, Arabic Spring that was around 2009, where we saw that people used phones and internet connectivity to spread the word, to show that there was something going on in the world. And with that, we can now uh, help certain groups accountable for certain wrongdoings. So with that, it gained way more momentum and we could see that the rise of social media became wider and wider. It became a global adopted phenomenon where people wanted to use their devices to communicate with other people all around the world. So that gave me eyes and ears everywhere. That's basically how I look at the internet, because if I want to find someone, a criminal, so recently I was looking into some Russian spies that were caught in Sweden, so there was nothing more than a news article on the Swedish news. And I was like, hey, I can see a villa that they lived in. I can geolocate that. And then I could geolocate it. I found the location and then I could point maybe some geolocation tools on it that showed me that there were telegram users active in those coordinates of those buildings. So with that, I found user accounts. Those user accounts had usernames. Those usernames were unique. And with that, I could find new people that we didn't know about. We found businesses. We found so much more that was originally in that news article. And with that, you now know where those spies um, were active for 
at least 12 years in, in and around Sweden, who they were with, who they did business with, because all those businesses are in open sources. All their traces on social media, even though they used aliases, still are traces, which I can use. They leave behind so much valuable nuggets that I can use. But we see that the landscape is shifting. This is in the time where there was little to no encryption. There was people were not that aware of people that they were looking at them. Um, could be me, could be a nation state, could be a law enforcement agency, but things are now changing. So when we look at slowly where we are going, when we look at the past, it will always matter to me because a criminal or a hacker was not <coughs> born as a criminal or a hacker that was doing, let's say, wrong negative things, because that's mostly what I do. I try to trace down, let's say, the bad people, or at least I think, I strongly believe that those are bad people. But when we look at that, they order pizzas. So bad guys order pizzas too. So we can find information about that. So we can find their human footprint, we can find their company footprint before they were operational security aware. So with that, I could map out maybe their network, their friends, their connectivity, the devices that they used. And with that, I can learn more and more about those targets to specifically pivot into that intelligence requirement. Now, when we look at the present, and this is kind of mimicking my youngest daughter, they are so sensitive for shiny new apps and they never read the terms of services. But most of those terms of services will, clear state, will, clearly, will clearly state what you are sharing what kind of information is out there. And that information very often I can find in open sources or open databases. And with that, you find again, a human footprint, maybe company information before they were operation secure, secure little small, little funny side story. Since I'm still talking about my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, she's now 15. She's in high school. She just texted me 10 minutes ago Dad, we need to talk. I think I hacked the school system and I can change my grade. I'm like, oh, and I'm, I'm definitely not a hacker. There are a lot of people in here that, that are way, way better than I'm like, well, stop, <laughs> email your mentor, tell him what you did, give yourself a 10. So the highest grade in Dutch and we, or Monday morning, we will go to school and I will help you out here. We need to do some responsible disclosure here because <laughs> something might be misconfigured, but just for me, that also shows that when you look at this, she used some techniques that I taught her because, well, I've built courses and I've been like, Hey, here are the course books, go explore. And she was like, Oh, I could do some URL manipulation to find something. And with that, she probably discovered some, but I'll need to find out a little bit more details because maybe I need to confiscate her PlayStation just to make a statement. No hacking. Um, so when it comes to open source intelligence, the present for me, when you look at some numbers that I, that I've, that I basically looked up, um, this is my biggest problem. Now the population in the world is around 8 billion people. We have more than 5 billion, uh, unique mobile users all around the world. We have 5 billion internet users and we have, um, almost four and a half or just over four and a half billion active social media users. Which means if I need to find that one little nugget where someone is saying, Hey, I am planning a bombing because I did a lot of counter ter terrorism work. I'm part of a terrorism cell. How do you find that one person that makes that statement somewhere online on one particular, maybe hidden platform? How do I find that? That's my biggest challenge now in the present. Where do I even start to look? And if I know where to look, how can I hide myself in such a way? that those people are not immediately awar alarmed. So that's one of the biggest challenges. So when I look at that concept, uh, the present is also for me looking at desktop devices versus, mo versus mobile, because mobile devices give, a, at least for most open source intelligence practitioners, a new challenge. Um, it's way harder to step up your operation security on a mobile device because there's a lot of more telemetry going on, GPS chips built in that cannot always be turned off by default. So that means something for my investigations. Wearables, also a new challenge. They emit all kinds of signals. They connect to all kinds of stuff. It gives us chances, but also challenges for me to find information. 
But with that, I can now also use the power of the crowd. And that's something that, for example, the, the group that I was part of, Bellingcat uses. They use people all around the world, armchair internet investigators, what, what Elliot Higgins calls it, <coughs> to basically spend time and help out in certain investigations. But that also brings a risk, because do you know if you can trust the people that are in that crowd that are helping you? So there are a lot of challenges. I can also see that when you look at the early states of the internet, it was mainly text-based. That is for me way more easy to look into, for example, when we compare it to pictures or videos. So with videos, it brings new challenges because one minute of video, there can happen an awful lot in the video that I now need to find and geolocate. Yesterday, there was a, um, a Nazi group that was streaming a laser kind of uh, thing on the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam. So I, I'm undercover in that telegram group where they are, and there is no coincidence, but I was reached out by a Dutch journalist uh, uh, earlier today, and he was like, hey, I found that video, and they stopped at a gas station. That's a very specific gas station. Nico, can you help me geolocate it? And there's no coincidence. I was filling up my tank before driving here, and I was at that gas station. <laughs> so he literally take, I was like, how do you know where I am, man? How do <laughs> so I took a picture, this the location? Yes, that's the location. We found it, but also, if I would not had that luck, I could have found that location in under five minutes because it was a Shell gas station. There was clearly uh, Starbucks visible in the reflection of the mirror. There are only nine Shell stations in the Netherlands that have a Starbucks. And with that, it's just, well, basically excluding the ones that do not match up one-on-one -on -one with the picture, and you can find that location. So, funny story. Um, things that I need to deal with that I will also show you some examples of in just a moment is, for example, artificial manipulation. So deep fakes or filters that we have on Snapchat, those are becoming a real challenge. So everything that's StyleGAN or DALL-E orientated will um, form a bigger challenge for people trying to tackle, for example, disinformation. And there's a lot of disinformation going on and fake news going on. Uh, digital warfare, where we see a lot of groups all around the world uh, attacking infrastructure and that kind of stuff. Again, every move that they make, they leave behind traces, and those traces could be in open sources. Definitely not always, but it's at least something that I can work with, maybe with a red team or another team that can feed me certain pieces of information that I can use and do my, let's say, skill set upon to find maybe a little bit more. But I think the biggest challenge now is for me that I used to be able to do everything manually, but I need to start automating more stuff because there's simply too much information out there for me to deal with. So when we look at that, I need to make use of hackathons. So hackathons where, well, just like an event <coughs> like this, where you get a group of like-minded people, you throw them a challenge and you say, hey, let's solve this puzzle. We need to find the people who are responsible for the downing of the MH17. Here's video footage, here's some other footage, now let's find some stuff. Uh, so community-driven research is really helping in that. So, and with that, you also have global availability, 24-7, 365. Because, well, I like to sleep every now and then, but someone at the other side of the pond can continue my work. But also, they can maybe deal with a different language or diff different character sets that I cannot deal with. So that brings a little bit of power back to what I need. Now, just showing you one little example on uh, the power of working as a collective on an open source intelligence case. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you a case study from uh, my time at Bellingcat, where there was an execution by a rebel group, a rebel leader called Mr. Alwe Fali, and this was the first case where open source intelligence information led to the conviction with, in the International Crime Court. So what happened here, there was a rebel leader um, who had a bunch of captives and they were brutally executed at a given location. That footage was found and basically handed over to Bellingcat and basically for accountability, we wanted to prove a point and say, we want to prove who were involved, where, but more importantly, when exactly, because we needed to find evidence. So let me show you the video and I will slowly walk you through that. So what we used is a bunch of 
let's say, leads and pivot points. So here you see him basically reading his sentence to the people who are going to get murdered. We will not show the horrific stuff, but based upon that, we could extract stills. So we could extract little screenshots together that we piece together in a panorama because we wanted to have a good overview of that situation. So if you grab those stills and you stitch them all together, you basically get a broader perspective. And you use that as little pieces of the puzzle to geolocate that specific location. So there are things that you can see. You can see, for example, um, a fork in the road, or you can see some specific buildings. We can see that there are so, is a wall, there are some bushes, and there's a fork in the road. All these things added up create a unique fingerprint of that location. Now we knew that it was somewhere in Benghazi, but that's a really broad province. That is, let's say, 500, kilo, 500 kilometers in square. So that means that we need to find that. So we try to look for similar looking building, buildings to narrow down that rough location. So we found a rough location, but we still needed to validate where exactly did this incident happen. So with a team of 10 people, 10 hours a day at least, we started basically scavenging Google Maps meter by meter. So we created little grids and we gave every team member a task. Look at this part, look at this part, look at this part. Take notes if you can find it. Well, in the end, one of the team members said, I think I found the location. And then everybody got excited again after hours and hours of looking. And we then we need to validate. We need to be sure. So we find those buildings. We see the wall. We have the fork in the road. But if we zoom in a little bit more, we need to find a little bit more because we also want to know exactly when. So if we find that camera position that we found in the original footage, we can line that up with what we see on Google Earth. So we can actually do an overlay and we can see those bushes and we can see all kinds of details that match one-on-one -on -one with the location from the footage. <coughs> it gets even more interesting because when we looked at the satellite imagery, we could even see the blood stains in the ground from the execution. So with that, the International Crime Court had some people going over there on the ground and take ground samples to make sure if there was actually blood. And yes, the blood was there. So with that, we were, let's say, confident enough that this must have been the location. Now, the next task was when, when exactly did this happen? When was the most likely time when this event happened? And the sun is basically the oldest clock that we have. So with some shadow cast and some uh, calculations and a specific tool called SunCalc, which again is nothing more than a free website online, we could calculate when this happened. So we line it up. So we determine the time, and if you line it up, we could say that this event happens roughly around 17 July, around 6.47 uh, uh, UTC. Now, if we do that, we could also see based upon satellite imagery when the blood stains were not there and when they were not there. So with that, we could say, well, we find a time frame where we say it's confident that in this time frame this happened. So I think this is a a perfect example on if you have a group that's persistent enough, that has a lot of, t a lot of tenacity and a laptop and an internet connection, and you can solve these cases. There were no pay tools involved here. There was no specialized software involved here. It's basically critical thinking and a lot of time where you need to solve the puzzle. So this, I think, is one of the best stories that I could tell that shows the power of open source intelligence when it comes to um, yeah, holding, holding people accountable for their wrongdoings. Now, when we look at the present, I need automation. I cannot do that heavy lifting myself anymore. I'm getting older, I'm getting sick and tired of doing everything automatically. So we need certain tools and certain capabilities that can scale up what we do. Because when we look at the evening clock riots during uh, the pan pandemic, we had in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, we had some very pretty disturbing evening clock riots. So you can only imagine that, for example, law enforcement wants to analyze that footage to make sure that the right wrongdoers are being caught. But if you now need to analyze, let's say, four or five hours of footage, it means that you will spend months analyzing that footage. But luckily, there are techniques out there, artificial intelligence and machine learning, that you could basically generate an overlay over that footage that will help you speed up 
your analysis process. And that's a little spoiler for tomorrow because there's a little workshop that I'm giving that will walk you through how you could scale that up. Now, here's a little example of that, what I, what I will show you tomorrow. So there are some tools out there from which you can use an API, for example, the Google Cloud Vision API, that will allow you for free to analyze footage at scale. And it will show you when persons appear in a frame, when certain <coughs> brands, when certain logos, it will translate text in real time in any language. It will show you um, um, file language, it will show you all kinds of interesting pieces of information. And you can only imagine if you need to do this all by hand, you would spend hours and hours, if not weeks, finding that information. And this simply speeds up my process. Now I can spend more time looking at, hey, I'm looking for that red car. Show me in these three hours worth of footage where this red car appears, instead of going frame by frame through that footage. Now. When we look at the present, criminals are begin becoming more and more aware of what we are doing. Here I have an example of a telegram group where a bunch of far right-wing Nazis are telling other right-wing Nazis how they could give me a hard time. So they're basically telling many organizations nowadays have uh, open source intelligence analysts in place. And what they're basically <coughs> saying here is, is that if they flood you with enough disinformation or fake news, they can keep me occupied for months. And I see this happening. And particularly since chat GTP, I hate to say it, chat GTP, but it's everywhere. I see a super increase in disinformation that is heavily being abused to spread, let's say, a false narrative of any subject matter. Now I'm hoping, of course, I'm seeing some companies that are building chat GTP detection software that, that will help me in the near future because it's a, it's a constant rat race when it comes to these technologies. Now, another thing that I need to deal with is deep fake or manipulated videos. So here we see a small boy walking against a fence in a rig and there's a waterfall. What? Oh, I'm hoping he won't fall down because that will be, let's say his last day of breathing. And this looks, super real but this can be done on a smartphone a cheap smartphone you simply download an app you add a little bit of a green screen and you can manipulate this to look like something else and it's super hard to show if this is manipulated you will need more sophisticated software that could do maybe counting of pixel levels and depth to um, to show you that there may be something wrong with this footage. So that's these are the challenges that I need to deal with now. And you can only imagine that this is just <coughs> starting this deep fake technology. 10 years from now, we won't be able to tell what's wrong or what's not wrong or what's manipulated or not. I'm hoping that we will still be capable, but I anticipate that that will become increasingly challenging. Now, another thing, making a deep fake, super easy. You download the smartphone app again. I think some of you are familiar with Snapchat or Instagram filters, and you can make someone appear to be someone else. I use this also myself because I need fake accounts, fake personas online to move around because, well, you can only imagine if you're trying to trace down FSB or GRU agents that you don't want to do that under your own name. So you need to create a false persona. So with that, we can use these techniques, but they also perform, they perform a big challenge for me to, to at least try and prove if Mandy is actually Mandy or not. So we need to deal with this. So here we have Zelensky. Well, and this is a really crappy deep fake because we can see that his body is not moving. Um, it's only his hat moving. The blinking is really odd when you look at the eyes. So those are still those little tells. But what if I told you that this video went viral in 15 minutes and reached 17 million people in, five, in 15 minutes and there were actually a couple of thousand people in Ukraine who laid down their arms because he's basically calling to the Ukrainian people, say, hey, lay down your arms, surrender. And people he actually did that based upon this little video that certain groups made to go viral on numerous social media platforms. So with that, it's not only for me always trying to prove, hey, there's a deep fake, but also sometimes I need to stop videos from spreading as soon as possible because things can go sideways really fast. Just showing you that it doesn't have to be advanced. Now with StyleGAN, um, 
you can make basically make anything here i'm asking to to generate a bald guy with a hoodie and glasses i was trying to get let's say a false persona for myself i use these faces because social media accounts need a profile picture and i'm not going to use your picture because first of all that would may get you into into trouble and also gdpr that could be a little bit sketchy so i use these as well myself but it also, again, poses a challenge for open source intelligence investigators. How do I know that the profile that I'm viewing is actually a person or is it being puppeteered by someone? Now, when you look at this concept, you can also flip this a little bit around. You can also use this again to spread this information. So I started to explore this a little bit. And the next example, I'm basically asking this StyleGAN DALI kind of technology, say, hey, show me a picture of a war aftermath. Show me satellite imagery of a warm aftermath. And again, it creates this out of thin air based upon a computer algorithm. But we get now satellite imagery that looks awfully real that I could spread on social media saying, hey, the Ukrainians or the Russians did a, did a bombing again. And people like me may spend hours and hours investigating a satellite image that has never existed and will never exist. But again, people use this. I see this happening more and more, particularly in the last half year. This technology is heavily being abused within certain groups to spread this information and fake news. So again, it's wonderful technology but it will definitely be abused for wrongdoings. Now, when we look at this scalability, I need to graph out certain pieces of information. So a graph is nothing more than a data structure that contains entities. So entities could be all of you and nodes. So we have a connection. So in this case, I could be the speaker and the connection that we have is that you are listeners and we now are connected together in a graph, in a picture. So for network analysis, I need to do this because I want to map out certain connections and see who knows who, who has certain access to certain data or whatever. It really depends on what I want to find out. So with that, you can use a lot of tools that will help you connect the dots. And this is where I'm getting at. In the present and in the future, we need to scale up. So in the good old days when we had hives, I could do this manually. I could find someone's profile, maybe that hacker that was doing kind of, let's say, illegal stuff that need to, me need to be mapped out. Or I could find, let's say, that cocaine cartel criminal or maybe some other criminals. I could do that manually. But now with people having so much connections on numerous social media platforms, it's nearly impossible for me to do this manually. So you need scalable tools that are capable of automatically collecting data at scale from open sources. So the data is already out there, but these tools make it possible for me to collect the data and spend more time on the actual analysis to answer that intelligence requirement. So when we look at that, um, one of these things that helped me is that there was an anonymous tip that um, someone said um, through um, misdaad anonym, so calling crime anonymously, um, hey, we have a link to a streaming video account, kind of like Twitch, where someone is making a statement that he is planning a school shooting in the Netherlands. Now, there were a lot of smart investigators looking at this, but they got stuck on a dead end. In the end, it was all about persistence, or at least that, that's my humble opinion. So they reached out to me and said, hey, Nico, can you help? You know a little bit about open source intelligence. Can you help us find the guy who was claiming to plan a school shooting? So I said, well, send me the information that you have. And they sent me the link to that streaming channel. And on that streaming channel, there was a guy, uh, what we call in our world a typical incel, uh, so someone who never leaves his room. I think there are some incels here, like myself. I also tend not to like my, my little hacking room. Um, but this guy was almost, I think it's safe to say, almost 14 hours per day live streaming. Sometimes he was just sitting behind his computer doing nothing. You could just see him sit there sitting. But in one of those videos, he made a statement that he was planning a school shooting. So I needed to go over all that footage and see if I could find that information. At that moment, I was not aware of the techniques that I will discuss tomorrow in the workshop. So this was manual work. So I watched, I think, almost 24 hours worth of video footage until I found a statement that confirmed, yes, he literally said on mic, on camera, I'm planning a school shooting somewhere close to where I live. That was, that was the little statement. Just to give you an impression, impression of what I had to look at,
This is moving footage, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, I need to be on better behavior, dude. You just need to be more careful. <coughs> yeah. Especially in regards to like... Um, drinking outside. I need to keep it low key for a while. Well, you get the idea. This was hours and hours of footage. And here he's basically saying, hey, I need to stay low key. I need to stay under the radar. I think people are on to me. Um, so I looked at the footage. I found evidence. Yes, he made that statement, but still I did not know who he was. We wanted to know where he could be found because, well, I think if someone's claiming to plan a school shooting, you may want to at least knock on that door and say, hey, is everything okay with you? Should we, should we talk or something? So I watched all that footage over and over again. And interestingly, I found some, at least some proof that this was a guy that was most likely in the Netherlands or spent time in the Netherlands. So I found a Dutch bank account pass, so a debit card. So that at least so could say, well, this might be a guy that lives in the Netherlands. I'm still not sure. And I found a location of a Albert Heijn in Amsterdam. So this is literally, if you have this picture and you reverse image search that picture, it will tell you immediately, Google will tell you, hey, this is the Albert Heijn in Amsterdam. So with that, I found again, a little bit more confirmation that made me a little bit more confident. Yes, this guy is most likely in or around the Netherlands and he has maybe living there, but still not enough. So I watched the footage, the footage, and in the blink of an eye, this guy hovered over his account in his Google browser. And with that, it exposed two email addresses. And I was like, yes, finally, I do not, do not need to watch this guy anymore. So with that, <laughs> I found two uh, usernames and two email addresses. And I will tell you, if you give me an email address or a username, the likelihood of me finding something about you is pretty high. So with that, I used some, uh, in this case, some automated tools in Multigo to pop in that email address and say, hey, can you show me what social media accounts are used to set up this account? And it told me, hey, I found numerous. With that, I was capable of finding, uh, finding a Facebook page that gave me his official first and last name. Also confirmation on where he lived and where he went to school. And with that, I had, let's say, enough information to hand over to the authorities and say, well, maybe you want to knock on this guy's door. And with that, um, I think it's safe to say that we might have prevented a school shooting somewhere in the Netherlands. So I think that, again, shows a great example of how powerful open source intelligence in certain cases can be. And, of course, that we need persistence, tenacity, but also tools that will scale up and speed up my overall investigations and analysis because if i needed to graph this out manually i would probably need again a couple of days and we were under time constraint because what if he picked up that firearm now and went out shooting so there was time was of the essence now things that i need to deal with is nft so NFTs are being used by terrorist groups, in this case, the Islamic State, use NFTs to spread, let's say, their propaganda. And why do they use it? Well, it's censor resistant. So you put up your prep propaganda and there's no authority in the world that can take down that content. And with that, it gives them extra power to spread their message and spread all the horrific things that they want to do. So I can still find it. But again, for the authorities to take this down, this will be a big challenge. And I need to learn and hopefully talk to people like you that are way smarter when it comes to cryptography and that kind of stuff to tell me, hey, maybe Nico, if you look here or do that, that could help people and other investigators all around the world to prevent, let's say, terrorist groups to become active and do all kinds of horrific st stuff. Now, when we look at the future, uh, well, the, the future is for me impossible to, to, to see, but I can give you my perspective on what I anticipate upon when it comes to my profession, open source intelligence. What should we be aware of? Well, the metaverse is coming, so virtual worlds, that mean something for investigators all around the world. I, it also gave me a good excuse to tell someone, hey, I need to order those Facebook goggles because I need to also give, give, a, give an excuse to, again, get a company credit card out or something. Um, but what if you need to show your government ID to get access to the metaverse? 
How could criminals use that and abuse it? How could how can now I search there anonymously? So there are challenges. Web 3.0 is becoming more and more decentralized, so more blockchainized. It means that traces will be transparent, but who basically made those traces will be pretty hard for me to pinpoint to say, hey, you are the person who's responsible for posting this information online because everything is decentralized and also encrypted pretty heavily. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is also blurring my sight, just like ChatGTP is doing. I do not always immediately know if this is you behind the keyword or some kind of algorithm. But also keep in mind when we look at, for example, what Google does is they will tailor your results based upon your searching behavior, particularly if you are logged in into your accounts. So that means that they will custom tailor your search results. But if I get back custom tailored search results, it means that I could miss information that could be very valuable for my investigation. So I need to figure out ways to blur out my digital fingerprint by rotating maybe IP addresses, by setting up ad blockers, but ad blockers by themselves will track you. So there are multiple ways that I need to deal with to tackle the future to get unfiltered information. And that is a huge challenge to get unfiltered information and unfiltered search results because every search engine out there, so Google, Bing, Yandex, the big ones, they will all give you custom tailored results based upon your device fingerprint and your overall behavior online. And that again is a big challenge. Um, we see more and more devices being connected to the internet. I recently ordered a new dishwasher and the guy who installed it in my home, he's like, can I get the, the Wi-Fi password? And I'm like, why? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's for your dishwasher. I'm like, why does my dishwasher does need Wi-Fi? Well, you can turn it on and off remotely. Why? I'm not that lazy. But it means that, again, we have now a device connected that could be vulnerable, uh, that could be exploited, but also could be maybe used by me to find maybe, again, someone's email address or someone's username because we have a user account now for a dishwasher. And that leaves behind traces that could be used to find something. So do never forget that those are things that we need to deal with. Uh, one thing that I think will give me an advantage is that we can communicate as humans. So virtual human intelligence, interpersonal interaction is really valuable for me when it comes to finding, let's say, stolen data sets or breach data. I sometimes want to communicate with those people and say, hey, where is this coming from? What is happening? What's your interest? Why are you actually sharing this data breach? Um, so we need that. In essence, the biggest issue that I have is that I need to deal with data at a very large scale and I need my traditional tradecraft techniques, but I also need to learn how to scale up what I do. And I will tell you beforehand that most open source intelligence investigators are not programmers. They are not developers. Uh, for example, I teach a course and the most demanded feature that people want to teach me is learning how to program in Python because that can speed up and automate certain stuff. But if you have never touched a terminal on your computer or a shell, that's a challenge to teach people how to program something. So those are things that we need to deal with. Or maybe the open source intelligence world needs to team up way more with developers. I like to sit down with developers and just explain to them, hey, this is my problem. You know how to code. I know some fundamental principles of coding, but can you help me out? Can you give me a different angle or perspective? Can you maybe whip up some code to show a proof of concept? Those kind of things. That's what we need. Now, when we look at Web 3.0, um, we are becoming more and more um, entangled in the augmented world where the mix between reality and virtual reality becomes blended. And with that, um, Again, I think it will become increasingly more challenging for us to stay anonymous in what we do, but also it become, will become way more challenging for me to find criminals online. Um, now, the other thing is when we look at the near future, I also think that all the things that are now giving me trouble can help me um, become better and more efficient in what I do. So when I talk about goal and scoping, talking to my client, I can use those machine learning lessons learned and integrate them into new cases. So I can use those algorithms to help me make find early warnings or get other things. Uh, it can help me automatically gather data. 
that is within the scope in, of my investigation. Uh, I can get um, automated monitoring or alerting for certain keywords or certain things. So think again, if someone is planning a terrorist attack and they may be using certain <coughs> words or keywords, I want to monitor for those keywords to get that early warning on. Also, processing of data, large scale. I can use now object recognition, facial recognition, natural long, uh, language processing to again scale up my processes on average. And with that, the analysis, the pattern matching, and the trend detection and visualization will help me be more efficient in what I need to do. I will simply will have more time to do the factual analysis, the INT part within open source intelligence. So with that, I think all these techniques that are forming hurdles within my investigation will in the near future also be capable to help me. Now, when we look at that near future, Web 3.0, challenge for open source intelligence, uh, decentralized stuff will become increasing challenging. The semantic web, smarter web, so computers that will think for themselves um, will become a problem. Blockchain technology, um, great technology, but not always good for finding something or someone. Um, and of course, evolved AI and machine learning will perform and maybe even bigger challenge. But we're already in this state because when we look at this, we are already living in an internet connected world where every device seems to have a connection to the internet, just like my dishwasher, cameras, Bluetooth, everywhere. So with that, it gives me also those eyes and ears. There's a lot of opportunity. Now, going back a little bit about open source intelligence and virtual human intelligence, I think that the human intelligence world, which is basically tradition, traditional spy tradecraft mostly, where they talk to someone in exchange for information, or they are willing to share some information, but we can move that to the digital world. And we can use that to maybe get access to open sources that we do not know about because we can literally talk to people. So virtual humans is nothing more than virtual human intelligence and it's intelligence derived um, and information from um, human sources that we can talk to. And this is particularly useful, or at least where I use it mostly for, for breached and leaked data. The people who offer that or the hacker groups that are involved with that. For example, I'm now currently heavily involved in trying to trace down the people behind KillNet. Now, some of you may be looking at it from a different perspective, maybe a more cyber threat intelligence perspective, but I'm going to look at the human aspect because in, in the end, it's people operating, puppeteering what they are doing. So I want to find those guys and girls who are responsible for those kill net, uh, maybe a DDoSing of a hospital or something, but I want, want to position myself covertly in maybe their Telegram channels and learn what they are planning. And with that, I could inform someone else or where they are talking about that they want to have a certain box. Yes, five minutes. I'm, uh, I'm almost there. Um, so why is this important? Well, the Internet is here. It will not go away. Uh, there is simply more and more cybercrime all around the world. And these online numbers will keep climbing. And um, your sources are online. So if you need to do good, if you want to find the bad guys and girls all around the world, we need to do some traditional work combined with human intelligence. Now to wrap this up slowly, um, what is important? We need to educate people all around the world. We need to have tenacity and we need to have NER time. And I asked for NER time in all the companies that I work for. It stands for never ending research and development. So I need time to explore new stuff. I need time to learn about a new app and a tool, how I could leverage that within my investigation. I need time what a new M1 processor on a MacBook means for my investigation because it screws up your virtualization and I heavily rely on virtualization. So these are all little hurdles that I need to take. I need to build personas, longer term sock puppets that I need to position. I need your help, industry experts, from a different perspective. So I need those partnerships and you also need open source intelligence specialists to perform what you need to do. So uh, distant future, web 4.5.0, basically bigger data. We have more digital al alter egos, but a, I think a great example is, and this is kind of tying it into what Jet, Jet TTP is doing, Google had Lambda. And the guy, one of the guys at Google who was behind Lambda basically said, hey, we need to stop this because it's getting a conscious. And that by itself is kind of disturbing because if computers are going to start thinking to, to themselves, we might see those terminators pop up here and there. 
So these are things that we need to deal with, and this is open source intelligence. So in the future, the heavy lifting will most likely be done by machines in the form of algorithms, hardware, software-wise. Uh, but we still need that traditional tradecraft because humans understand sarcasm, idioms, figure of speech. Computers still have a very hard time in interpreting that. Critical thinking within open source intelligence or in any form of intelligence is the key to success. Doubt everything assume nothing, check everything. And the final decision, who will make the final decision? Will it be a human or will it be an algorithm? So with that, to wrap it up, we need open source intelligence investigators that have nerd time. They are need to understand the tradecraft. They will need to have proper hardware and software. Now, a lot of companies will not always give people the proper hardware and software. So they need that. They need education, budget, uh, of course, we will find more bl blind spots in the near future, but it also opens new spots with new technology. And as the internet grows, we basically need more power in the form of humans and computers. And we need to be able to adopt, adapt, and become an adapt of those new technologies. So the future, well, it's actually now, not tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. My um, pleasure. We have some few minutes left for maybe a question. Here's a question, Chris. Hi, Nico. Uh, as an uh, OSINT researcher, uh, how do you prevent your confirmation bias? Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you said, yeah. well, you started with a good question, yeah. but there's so many data available on the internet, so you might find an answer. How do you reverse the process that once you have an answer, you say critically to yourself, is the false positive? Or do you have yeah. reviewers or you just cut your mind in two <laughs> that, that, that a good one question. is critical than the other? How well, do you do that? There are multiple playbooks to do that. So I like to use crap analysis and that's something that I can discuss, I cannot go into now that uh, the analysis of competing hypothesis, um, uh, critical thinking just in a group, just simply saying, hey, this is the evidence that I found and use the, the power of the group to point out maybe false positives. So there are, well, Two hands are not enough to show the, uh, the, the possibilities that I have to tackle my own biases and logical fallacies. Yes, very good question and really important within open source intelligence. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Wait, I'll come to you. So uh, what are some of the more ethical questions you ask yourself before taking on an assignment? So, so let's say I'm an operator of Killnet. Mm -hmm. And I want to see what you can find out about me. So yeah. like a, counter a counterintelligence perspective, like how, yeah. how do you get through that before taking on the assignment? Now, that's a good question. I'm, um, of course, I don't always know um, who, well, I always know who are my clients because I'm, I only will take in clients that I can meet face to face to face. Otherwise, I will not work with you. But on average, um, you could put in certain choke points in your investigation where you set up certain processes where you make sure that the other end of the line is actually the person that you are communicating with and not someone else. So there are multiple techniques, hardware and software wise to make sure, well, nothing is 100% certain, but sure enough that you will have, let's say enough confidence and comfort that you are actually dealing with the person that you want to deal with or not. Okay, one last question maybe. Yes. Yeah, Nico, during COVID times, uh, some Dutch companies were scraping Telegram groups, Twitch groups, whatever, as a business model and selling the data to other companies. What do yeah. you think about this? What my opinion about that is, um, it depends on the goal. That's... Making money? <laughs> well, the Dutch companies do. Yeah. But um, also keep in mind that a lot of companies are technically not capable of doing that themselves, so they are willing to buy it. The same counts for breach data. Some people buy breach data because they simply want to have it stopped. So, yeah, my personal opinion, I don't, <laughs> I don't ever want to deal with criminals or don't pay any criminal activities. But I do see that there is a need in the market for it simply because, well, just like I stated, there's too much information out there. And then if you're a small company, you need to do this on your own. And, or if, you, if you're not capable, you will probably need to go to certain vendors that will do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Nico. My pleasure. Please, everyone, give it up again for Nico Dakins.
Værsgo.